better safe than sorry. That's what we believe. It's always better to find disease early before it goes on to do something to hurt you. Better safe than sorry. If you've got any uh, lumps or symptoms or anything, and you go to your doctor and ask to find out what that is, your doctor will do some screening. That's called diagnostic screening. They're trying to find out what's wrong with you. I'm not talking about diagnostic screening today. I'm talking about medical screening, where you're perfectly healthy and you're told, get this screen, do this test, it will save your life. Now before I go on, I want you to roll up your sleeves and look at your arms for a second. Okay? So what do I see when I look at my arms? As I see a mole here, I've got a, a birthmark there, and another little lump here that I don't know what it is, and I have a scar in the back of my hand from a machete in Thailand. <laughs> Basically, on the outside of your body, you have the marks of life well lived. So hold that thought for a second. I spend a lot of time, and I have for the last 18 years, looking at the way the pharmaceutical industry markets drugs and the promises they make. And I try to look at the science underneath those promises. I think that I've been a skeptic most of my adult life, though I have to admit my sister disagrees. She says, I'm the youngest of four, by the way, she said that when I was younger, that I would believe everything. She would say, look, there's a unicorn. And I would say, where? <laughs> but for photographic proof, I want to say that my sister's wrong, and even at the age of three, I was a skeptic. <laughs> and I had that, you can't pull that BS on me. One morning when I was uh, eating my breakfast, this was about five years ago, a flyer, a yellow flyer, fell out of my newspaper. And it said, a body scan can save your life. Great, I want my life saved. And it was a group down in Port Angeles that were offering full body scans for people to come down, Canadians to come down, spend $500 or $1,000, they could scan your, your arteries, your organs, or you could get the full meal deal. Now, the full meal deal in a full body scan typically involves a CT scan or something like this. This is a 64 slice, a Kion Toshiba. Uh, computerized tomography scan. You go through this baby, this uh, what I would call a, a radioactive donut, yes. um, and it takes a picture of the inside of your body. Now, and this kind, this is the kind of picture that would, would show up in some, something like this. So we got a grant proposal together. We studied this. We spent a year looking at how was this being marketed. Was the federal government actually allowing this kind of thing? It really struck me as a high-tech snake oil scam. And I was confirmed that. We looked at uh, one of the research studies that we found behind full body screening was done by uh, researchers at the University of California in San Diego. And they took 1,192 perfectly healthy people, just like the people in this audience, and they gave them a full body scan. And guess what they found? They found that 86% of those people had things on the inside of their body, anomalies. Okay? And in fact, 2.8, the, the average person had 2.8 anomalies. So just imagine you, like the bumps and lumps on the outside of your arms, you've got them inside you as well. And when you find them with uh, weapons grade uh, <laughs> scanning equipment, <laughs> you'll notice a few military metaphors. Uh, when, they, when, they, when they do that kind of scanning, they will find them. And that begins the cascade of further scanning, further investigations, biopsies, surgery, and are people's lives saved at the end? And the answer is no. We found that full body scanning not only does not save your life, it's more likely to cost your life. We published this, and my uh, conclusion was that the consumer in the medical screening marketplace was naked. This guy's only half naked, but you, you know what I mean. So I said, okay, well, let's put that aside for a second. Let's throw that one out the window, and let's look at other kinds of screening. And I started looking at screening for cholesterol, screening for bone density, screening for Alzheimer's disease, for mental health issues. But seeing this is November, and uh, we just came through October, which I don't know if you remember, but October was a very pink month. 
you know, people who call it Pinktober because one of the main uh, if months that have been basically corporatized by the breast cancer community is that you should be wearing pink, running for the cure, and going out there and getting a mammogram. I don't have any problem with people wanting to raise money for charity. I think it's absolutely good. At the same time, hidden within that is the message that you should be vigilant, better safe than sorry. You should get your breasts screened regularly. Now this ad is from uh, Mother Jones magazine in 1990. The most curious thing about this, other than the punchline, if you haven't had a mammogram, you need more than your breasts examined. The implication being there is that not only uh, are you perhaps uh, jeopardizing your life, but you might be crazy. There they're recommending breast cancer screening for women 35 and older. But I can tell you right now, today, they don't recommend that women 35 and older get a breast, uh, annual breast uh, screen. In fact, they don't recommend women 40 and over get breast screen. They recommend that fifth, women 50 and older get a screen every one or two years. Why has that changed over the last two years? Why are they not recommending that older women get screened instead of younger women? And the answer is in one word. It's called overdiagnosis. And overdiagnosis, <coughs> but when they screen, when they look for disease, they find all kinds of things that isn't disease, and they can't distinguish between the disease and the thing that looks like disease. So you say, OK, well, what's wrong with screening women and finding some cancers early? The answer, of course, is that you have to screen a lot of people. Do you have to screen 80 women to find to save one life? That wouldn't be so bad. But when you look at the big research studies, and these are studies that are going over uh, 10 and 15 years, you find that you have to screen 2,100 women every year for 10 years to save one life. You might say, that's a pretty low yield. But that one person could be my wife, my mother, my sister. Maybe it's still worth doing. Maybe it's still worth screening annually for breast cancer. To which I would say, what is the other side of the equation? How many women experience false positives out of those 2,100 women? And the answer is that about 690 women will experience something unusual that they find when they do a mammogram. They'll find calcifications, nodules, unusual things that they don't know what it is, and that leads to biopsies, it leads to surgeries, lumpectomies, mastectomies, chemotherapy, treatment. And the other thing that it leads to that never gets mentioned, really any of the research that I've looked at, is the sheer psychological impact of telling 690 women that they have cancer when they don't. Well, this month we're lucky because it's November. <laughs> okay? And November is all about guys growing mustaches, proving our manliness, and essentially saying, get out there, raise awareness for prostate cancer, awareness, uh, for prostate cancer, and do what you can to make sure men have healthy prostates. I don't have any problem with that. But again, the implicit message in the whole race for the, uh, or the war against prostate cancer is that you should go out and get an annual PSA test. And a PSA test is just a simple blood test that men are offered, maybe when they turn 45 or 50. And this blood test can measure a certain antigen in your blood that can indicate that you might be at high risk of having prostate cancer. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, prostate cancer is actually extremely common, very common. In fact, the death rate from prostate cancer for men is about 3%. But the number of men who are going to develop prostate cancer, or evidence of prostate cancer in their lifetime, is about 60%. So you have this huge pool of potential eye overdiagnosis. Um, I had to throw this one in just to prove that the guy standing up there is me and I can't grow a mustache. Easy. <laughs> uh, but it's also three men in the boat. It's sort of, you know, what do you get when a, a naval officer, a Luffy, and a, and a Royal Marine sit in the boat? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My wife said, why are you putting that slide? <laughs> the point is 3% of men will die uh, from prostate cancer. 60 or 70% of us are going to have it in our lifetime. Is that a problem? If they screen, they are likely to find it. I'm almost 50. I probably have a 50% chance if I did a PSA test that they would find 
prostate cancer cells in my body. So you might say, but it still saves lives. Screening of men for prostate cancer saves lives. Question, of course, as a researcher, the guy's a bit of a skeptic. Well, how many lives did it save? Well, you have to screen 1,400 men to save one life. OK, again, that one life might be your husband, your uncle, your brother, your father. Is that not still worth it? To which I would say, well, how much overdiagnosis happens in there? And there's a fair bit. In this case, about 48 men would need to be treated in order to save one life. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, the treatment for prostate cancer is biopsies, surgery, chemotherapy, again and again. Men who become incontinent and impotent. In fact, one, uh, one researcher told me that we use the PSA test to hold it out as bait so that the men will be attracted and the urologist can zoom in and cut out your prostate. There's an enormous amount of money to be made in treating men for prostate cancer. And in fact, uh, uh, one person says, we're talking invasion of the prostate snatchers here. <laughs> <laughs> so back to the overall issue about medical screening. You know, we all believe that better safe than sorry. Okay? And of course, you might be asking yourself, what kind of irresponsible parent would let their 12-year-old daughter stand near a 400-foot cliff on the wrong side of the sign? Okay, I'm that kind of parent. <laughs> the, point, the, the point that I'm going to make here is that better safe than sorry is one thing, but I would always say that screening is not an emergency procedure. You have time to think about it, to read about it, to ask your doctor, to ask questions, and to question answers. So my response would be, the best thing to do when you're faced with someone who says, I can save your life with a screening test, your answer should be, well, I'm going to look before I leave. Thank you. Thank you.